that was published as a paid advertisement in Haaretz on the 22nd of September 1967 so quite soon after the June war of that year it is signed by 12 people not very well known some of them members of Matspen and others so, sort of supporters and it says our right to defend ourselves against extermination doesn't give us the right to oppress other people. Occupation entails foreign rule. Foreign rule entails resistance. Resistance entails oppression. Oppression entails terror and counter-terror. The victims of terror are generally innocent people. Holding on to the occupied territories will turn us into a nation of murderers and murder victims. Let us get out of the occupied territories at once. Uh, I am proud to be one of the signatories. Uh, so they, my, my parents met in Tel Aviv. They were not born there. They were both immigrants they came not uh, not specifically as uh, driven by Zionist ideology. It was it, it was coincidental. It was a, a question of sort of uh, more or less happenstance where where they ended up. I mean, they didn't come as as you know ideologically motivated pioneers of Zionist colonization. My mother was born in Baku. Baku is in Azerbaijan on the coast of the Caspian Sea and she was born in Baku because her father, my grandfather, maternal grandfather, migrated to Baku from where he was born which is now in Belarus to Baku uh, and he was involved in the oil business in circa 1900, first few years of the 20th century, the last few years of the 19th century. Uh, Baku was a major, the major, the most important uh, uh, focus of oil production in the world. So he was involved in the oil industry um, and she was born in Baku. They uh, migrated to Palestine after the, the revolution in the 1920s when the uh, Russian revolution caught up with that part of the world. It took some time for the revolution to spread to the Caucasian, uh, Trans-Caucasian uh, uh, areas of the Tsarist Empire to what is now Georgia and, and Azerbaijan. So they went to Palestine. My father was born in uh, the upper reaches of the Dnieper River in what is Belarus, around the, the city of Mogilev. And he uh, also migrated to Palestine. I didn't know it at the time as a kid. He died when I was eight. I remembered stories he told me that uh, he was uh, involved in some war. 
I found out later from family stories that he was in, involved in the civil war in Russia. And he was in the Red Army. Although he came from a bourgeois uh, background, my paternal grandfather died before my uh, father left uh, the Soviet Union and came to Palestine. I think he was a great admirer of Trotsky. The, the commander-in-chief of the Red Army. I think he probably heard him speak on one or two occasions and people, people who were present on occasions where Trotsky made speeches. <laughs> Apparently he was, he was an, 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 an incredible orator. All, all accounts of him say so. So uh, I found out long after he had died, when he came to Palestine, he, was, he left Russia probably when people who were sort of followers of Trotsky were feeling the heat. He, he, he left and he, he came to Palestine. They were both of Jewish background. My father had nothing to do with religion. He was uh, completely secular. Uh, he loved uh, pork. <laughs> Uh, my, my, my grandfather, of course, my pat maternal grandfather, was a, a religious, you know, conventionally religious, not a very fanatic one, but of course he kept all the, all the, the, the uh, kosher uh, 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 commandments. My mother, she often cooked for her parents, you know, bringing dishes for them. She had to keep separate dishes for my father because he liked non-kosher food, so uh, uh, she couldn't mix it, which had lots of sets, different sets of, of <laughs> pots and, and pans, uh, because m my father did, did, did not want to stick to kosher food. It was uh, nothing to do with, with religion. But my maternal uh, grandfather, of course, was a you know, different generation. But my, my uncles and aunts were not practicing uh, Jews in the, in the sense of uh, religion. Tel Aviv, when I, where I grew up, first of all, it was a, a, a purely Jewish city. It was, it was a secular and, and fun to, to grow up in, I must say. Uh, growing up next to the sea, you know, uh, walking to uh, the Mediterranean, you know, this, uh, Importantly, although there were some restrictions during the Second World War as far as, as uh, uh, consumer products, it was a time of prosperity. Actually, my, my earliest memories are from the Second World War. I was, I, I, I mean, my, my, my f the first definite memory is the day the Second World War broke out. And, and I, I was just three. I remember vaguely, I, and I, re, I remember some events during the, the uh, Second World War, how we sat in shelters, uh, because Tel Aviv, where I grew up, was bombed. Uh, not, not very extensively, but uh, uh, some Italian uh, planes came to bomb, and, and some bombs fell not far from where I, I was living. Uh, some people were killed. I mean, it was not extensive bombing. More extensive in Haifa, they tried to bomb the uh, oil refineries. It was a good time, I mean, to, to be living there, despite all the horrors that were taking place and rumors of which uh, started to percolate gradually. But locally, everything was fine. People started to talk about it. Uh, I can't t tell you exactly when, because, you know, I, I was still a kid, so I can't remember exactly when, but certainly by 1944, things were quite clear that there was something, something really horrendous was taking place in Europe. As far as I know, my relatives who were still in the Soviet Union were safe. They were in the, the eastern part of the Soviet Union. My, my wife's family uh, 
came from Poland. Well, that, 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 so, um, I mean, the, their fate was quite different. But I was 12 in 1948. So I remember events very clearly. Uh, no very direct experience of the war. I was living in Tel Aviv. Uh, the, the nearest the war came to us was the uh, ethnic cleansing of Jaffa which is next door to Tel Aviv. Foundation of Israel, for the, the day Israel was, was declared as, as a state, which was 15th of, of May 1948, was very joyful. I mean, this is, this is what we all hoped for, a Hebrew state. As, as a child, I mean, I remember the 47-49 war, the so-called Israeli War of Independence, uh, otherwise known to Palestinians as the Nakba. Nothing uh, came very close to us. I mean, the closest was uh, the uh, ethnic cleansing of Jaffa. We sort of knew about it. It wasn't very far away. But uh, I, I didn't realize what was going on, of course, I mean, the, the, the idea was that, you know, this, it's a miraculous victory. Um, later on, uh, I think during, during 1949, after the war had finished, uh, I was then in the uh, uh, Zionist Socialist Youth Movement. We used to go, you know, hiking through the uh, Galilee and so on, and, and I saw a lot of villages that had been ethnically cleansed just recently. Uh, it was clear that you know you, you could see the, what people had left behind. Although they were looted sooner uh, after the, the ethnic cleansing, but still you know people left things that, that uh, behind that the, the looters didn't bother to, to take. Cutlery and, and uh, uh, maybe a shepherd's flute. I, I remember finding in one of those deserted villages and so on. It was clear, I mean, the evidence of the ethnic cleansing was still there. It wasn't as yet covered over as it happened later. Old villages either overgrown or destroyed and built over with uh, Jewish settlements. But the, the, uh, the evidence of the Nagba was still there. And I, this, this I remember very clearly. I mean, it, 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 it couldn't fail but to make an impression of you that, that people had lived here and, and they are no, no longer here. Uh, how exactly it happened, I mean, this, this transpired a bit later, but that's, that's what I remember. Tel Aviv itself was insulated. I mean, it was a, a, as it is now, it's a bubble. But if you go to Tel Aviv now, you wouldn't get a feeling of, that you are living in a country which is in the middle of, of a conflict. Existence of, of a Palestinian population is not evident there in Tel Aviv. The settler community had its own military organizations before the war of 47-49. Of One major paramilitary organization, virtually an army, called the Haganah Defense. There were two other uh, military organizations. One uh, not, not very big called the, the Irgun, uh, actually Irgun Tzvai uh, National uh, Military Organization, which was the uh, precursor of the Likud party. And there was a small terrorist army, self-described self terrorist uh, group called the, the Fighters for the Liberation of Israel. 
known as the Stern Gang. At one point they wrote to the German government offering collaboration. I think before news came of the actual Holocaust, they were conducting violent terrorist, self-described terrorist activities against the British government. They thought they might get some support from the Reich. Of course, this was a, this was a crazy idea. They didn't get anywhere with this, but they, 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 they were prepared to uh, take this road. The British government encouraged the creation of units of the settlers community and trained them to uh, suppress, to help in suppressing the Arab revolt. There was also some participation of people from the, the settler community as soldiers in the British army during the Second World War, where they also got some training. So this was all uh, a foundation for what became the uh, Israeli so-called Defense Force. 1947-49 war ended in an incomplete, as it were, victory of Israel. There was still major parts of the holy land of the land of Israel, of Palestine, whichever you want to call it, which were outside Israel, which Israel did not reach. It is frequently noticed that in Israel's declaration of independence, Israel never actually declared its border. Normally, when you uh, create a new state, you state its borders. Is Israel never declared its borders finally because at least from the point of view of a major part of the Zionist leadership the the conquest of the 47-49 war were inadequate uh, they needed more this left Israel until today with a, a major existential problem from a Zionist point of view. But big part of the Zionist leadership, the more hawkish part and the dominant part really, the part that was really in charge in 1967, thought this was something that had to be corrected, that a, a failure to complete the conquests of, of Palestine and waiting for an opportunity. There was a hoo-ha propaganda worldwide that Israel is in danger of annihilation. Now, the Israeli generals knew very well that Israel was in no existential danger in 1967. A lot of people believed that it was. There were many volunteers coming, especially Jewish ones, coming to defend Israel, was in, which was in danger of, of annihilation. Poppycock. I mean, this, this, this was not on the Israeli generals knew very well that Israel is in no danger. This was a turning point in the history of the whole region and arguably in the history of the world, 67. Matspen is actually the name of a publication and it is also used to denote the organization that uh, published it which was the socialist organization in Israel it was founded in 1962 the initiative came originally from four people who were members of the Israeli Communist Party. Uh, two in the Tel Aviv branch and two in the Jerusalem branch. As a reaction against Stalinism. The Israeli Communist Party is not, as it claimed to be, a revolutionary party. We thought that a new beginning is uh, necessary. What we focused on was working class issues. 
this got us involved in some working class events, some some struggles of the, the uh, working class uh, in the area of Tel Aviv and elsewhere. So uh, we were uh, mainly focused on, on working class issues. As you can see, the, the motivation at that time uh, was not specifically, specifically to do with the Palestinian issue. An important Palestinian Marxist political figure by the name of Jabra Nicola, who had a, an enormous influence on the evolution of Matspen, its ideas on various things, but especially on the Palestinian issue. Being a Palestinian Marxist made an enormous difference. The ideas we arrived at, the insights we arrived at about the Palestinian issue, especially uh, by 1966, 67, before the 67 war, uh, I think are still valid. And uh, I think these are the most important insights that Matspen has uh, uh, left as, a, as its uh, heritage. Zionism is both an ideology and a project. Now, the ideology is that the Jews all over the world constitute not a religious denomination, not a, a religion. The Jewishness is not a religion, or not merely a religion, but a nation. And that this nation has some claim over the land of Israel, known as, as Palestine, it's the promised land. It's, it's God given. It's God, God promised it to the Jews. There's a very famous quip that in order to be a Zionist, you don't have to believe in God, but you have to believe that God gave the land of Israel, Palestine, to the Jews, which has a lot of truth in it, because at bottom, the claim uh, of Zionism that Zionism make on behalf of the Jewish so-called nation on, on Palestine is, is at bottom uh, grounded in religion. It is very important to uh, distinguish, and we made this distinction right then in, in the pre-67 uh, era. Historically, there were three main types of colonization. There were slave colonies, uh, very important originally in Brazil, in the West Indies, in the south of uh, North America, in what became the southern United States, and elsewhere, but these, these were the important places. There were what uh, uh, Kautsky, a, a theoretician, called exploitation colonies in much of Africa not only in South Africa, but in a lot of the colonized countries in, in Africa, which is most of, of Africa, with very few exceptions. And there is the third type, which Kautsky called work colonies, and which we described as exclusion colonies, where the native population is excluded either exterminated, as in Tasmania, for example, totally exterminated, or uh, ethnically cleansed. But we had very little echo, very little effect in the Israeli public. This changed abruptly after 67. We became a, a, a huge scandal in, in uh, the Israeli political scene, demonized. It uh, was a, a huge hate campaign. I mean, uh, it's unimaginable. It was a, a, a real pandemonium against us. 
because we came out against the occupation. And that created a huge hostile reaction. We became very well known and uh, of course they focused on, on the signatories and, and on Matspen as being not officially but partly involved in it. Uh, the country was swept with a, a frenzy of chauvinism, annexationism in, in uh, the wake of the June war of that year. And we were ostracized, I mean we, we got, you know, threatening uh, phone calls, etc. This kind of thing was, was uh, getting very unpleasant. Uh, I had two small children and older uh, of our children pick the phone up when when it rang and she would hear horrible threats and so on. It is still mentioned and talked about because signals we gave out, the analysis that we made, the position, the radical position, uncompromised position against Zionism and the Zionist colonization project, uh, support for, for uh, Palestinian rights, as it were, left a mark on the Israeli, I think, on the Israeli uh, political consciousness, which people from time to time returned to. Zionist colonization was uh, uh, carried on at the expense of the indigenous Palestinian people. Israel wants more territory, but it doesn't want more Arabs. So the, the reason why it didn't annex the Gaza Strip, m most of the West Bank after 1967, is because it is too densely populated. They want uh, land, but not the people. Yeah, I mean, the kibbutz movement encapsulated the, the uh, internal contradiction of uh, one wing of Zionism. It combined some socialist, quote-unquote, ideology with colonizing plans. So it was... Uh, like socialism, but only for Jews. And the, the uh, people who are uh, leading uh, Israel are not uh, satisfied by what they have. They want the whole of the land of Israel. They, are, they uh, want to annex the whole of it. They are waiting for an opportunity. I would say a certain proportion, perhaps not the, even the majority, are fervent, sort of uh, uh, ideologically extreme. In behavior, criminal towards Palestinians, you know, uh, uh, actually taking the initiative to make the lives of Palestinian people in the, in the West Bank as difficult as possible by burning their crops, uprooting their uh, olive trees, damaging their property, otherwise their, their homes, their cars. Uh, but the, these are possibly not the majority of the settlers. A lot of, uh, a lot of settlers are ordinary people who are attracted to the settlements simply for economic reasons, because they are uh, highly subsidized, because they get uh, good you know, uh, houses for much less than they would have to pay within the Green Line. It is a, 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 a policy that is encouraged by the Israeli government. There is no real ground for great optimism.
Now, since the middle of the 20th century, there was a whole spate of decolonization. Without exception, all these decolonizations took place in colonies where there was an other type of colonization, where the settlers remained a minority depending on the labor power of the indigenous people. So, the, the outcome is still open. It is possible, I mean, one, one projection which is possible that the Pal Palestine issue will end like Australia or North America. That is to say, with a, a further ethnic cleansing, completely wiping up the Palestinian people as, as a viable uh, entity. This is what the uh, Zionist planners wish for, and if they are given the opportunity, they will actually try to perpetrate major ethnic cleansing. This is one, this is, this is the worst possible. Uh, what is the other possible uh, outcome? Decolonization. This raises the, the question, and we pointed at this already in 1966, but it became even more acute later on. Decolonization uh, requires the overthrow of the Zionist regime. Who will do it? What, what agency? I mean, how can it be done? By uh, military action from outside? Forget it. I mean, this has been tried and, and it was shown to be a miserable failure. The Palestinian, majority of the Palestinian population does not have the leverage that the majority of the indigenous population in South Africa had, and this is the, the major difference in the political economy. Israel is, is, is possible to actually penalize or, or oppress and attack uh, any kind of Palestinian uprising as it has done in the past. The only force that is pivotal, I mean, not by itself, but who, whose participation in overthrowing the Zionist regime is, is pivotal and vital and critical is the Israeli working class. This returns us to the issue that occupied Matspen from its very beginning. But of course, we cannot speak of a, of a socialist revolution in Israel in the box of Israel Palestine. This is ridiculous. It can only be a, a regional, a regional process. We are talking about so this this was the position of Matzpan right from the period I was talking about. We said the only solution for the Palestinian problem, not for general uh, uh, doctrinal reasons, but because of the specificity of the situation, the only possible way of uh, decolonizing Palestine is in, in a socialist transformation of the whole region. Right? I mean, people who, who advocate a, a democratic uh, single state are, are good people. I mean, they, they, they wish well, but I, th I think they are up against the, the reality that in order to, to achieve the overthrow, to achieve a single democratic state, you need to overthrow the Zionist regime. And for this you need the, at least the consent, the, the participation of the Israeli working class. And how are you going to achieve this, if not on a socialist basis? You see, this is, this, this is I mean, this is the insight that we had, I mean, largely thanks to Jabra Nicola, who pioneered this way of thinking about the thing. So, uh, but, but what are the prospects of this? This is a theoretical possibility, whether it, it's going to materialize. I think, personally, I think it is more likely that Israel will first try to perpetrate a major new Nakba. I mean, what motivates me is not the Palestinian cause, but uh, socialism. 
support for the Apparently. rights of an oppressed people is is a consequence of socialist outlook. I'm not a, you know sort of primarily uh, motivated by support for Palestinians. Of course, I, I do support the rights of Palestinian people as of all uh, oppressed people, but in this case, uh, I'm sort of personally involved as it were, being part, part of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian complex. What's been, for me, it, it is uh, the most important thing in which I've been involved in my life, political life, uh, everything else follows from that. I'm, I'm waiting to be expelled. I don't want to. I, I just don't want to leave. Yeah. Mm. So, do you think they will expel you, or do you think they'll just go quiet for a couple of years? Well, in the end, you, I'm not going to go quiet. 